We're here outside the Kangaroo Point Detention Centre. Can you just I mean, briefly explain what's happening here? Around 120 refugees are currently being detained in a hotel at 721 Main Street, Kangaroo Point. The hotel is its really a glorified motel that's been converted into a prison. So this is certainly not luxury five-star accommodation. These men are being held multiple people to a room, really cramped conditions, no space for exercise in, and they're largely confined to their rooms for most of the day. The hotel even has a small swimming pool in the backyard, but the, the government doesn't even let them use that. So it's really much more like a prison. I think the word hotel is sometimes misleading. These men have been held in detention mostly for about seven years now, in some cases a little bit longer. Most of them were previously held offshore in places like Manus Island and Nauru and were brought to the mainland under the Medivac legislation because they all have serious health issues, whether that's mental health or physical health conditions. Over the last couple of months, uh, the men started protesting, holding silent protests on their balconies and residents responded by holding our own actions on the street as a show of solidarity and those sh solidarity protests continued weekly throughout the COVID-19 shutdown and now the have em emerged into a 24-7 blockade of the site so we know the government is trying to relocate some of the men held here to higher security detention facilities we know that there are still open conversations about potentially even relocating some of these men back to Christmas Island or up other offshore facilities. And so part of the purpose of the blockade on the ground is to prevent those forced transfers. Our specific intention is that if the government tries to move some of these men to high security facilities, we will physically block the roadway and block those cars from leaving the compound. The other big benefit of the blockade is that it provides a sense of moral support and solidarity with the men inside who for years now have felt like they're forgotten. So the mere fact that so many residents are willing to spend time on the ground showing their support is a huge morale boost to the men who many of whom are suffering severe mental health issues. So there's quite a practical, tangible, immediate benefit to having an on-site presence just in terms of the mental health of the men inside. Above and beyond that though, the blockade serves to maintain ongoing community awareness of the issue, to maintain continued media interest, and thus ensure that this issue doesn't get swept back under the rug. So a couple of weeks ago at the rally, you were speaking about both the injustices in the past and how people can ask themselves, how can, how can injustices like that happen? And also you were talking about, uh, you know, I guess the, the power of people power to actually to make progressive changes. Can you make some yeah. comments about those things now? I think a lot of Australians have been inoculated to ignore just how serious these human rights abuses are. This is not a small thing that's going on on our watch. This is hundreds and hundreds of refugees who have a legitimate fear of persecution and who ought to be granted asylum being held indefinitely in detention for no reason. This serves no public benefit. This is contrary to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Refugees. It's uh, contrary to the Convention Against Torture. So this is a pretty severe and significant systemic abuse of human rights. And it's basically just crept up on us gradually over many years. Piece by piece, this system of incarceration has been assembled. And I think people have just looked the other way for a really long time. And it's, I think, illustrates how a populace can have their consent manufactured gradually without them even realising it. And we often look at what's happened in other nations or at other points in history and we say, how did the people allow this to happen? How did the government get away with this? People knew this was happening and yet they did nothing. And often we feel this almost contempt for those people. It's like, what were they doing? Why did they look the other way? Did they not care about these human rights abuses? Did they not care about these injustices? And yet right now, a very similar thing is happening right here on the ground in our very city. And so that obviously raises the question of, well, what is our moral duty in these times? Can we content ourselves with signing petitions and writing submissions? Obviously, I think the answer is no. I think we need to be doing more than that. It's not enough to just vote at an election once every three or four years. It's not enough just to post on social media. We need to engage in other more direct forms of activism that put substantial pressure on the nation state and on the major political parties. I mean, actually, just responding to what you said then, I mean, one thing that occurs to me about how this policy has been, how they've been able to get away with this policy, mm. I mean, obviously the refugee rights movement has won a number of concessions over the years, mm. 
and to me, I think it is striking that it would have been, it would be impossible for this policy to be implemented without the ALP support. Mm. If the AL, ALP had stood up against mm. what the Howard government was doing and then hadn't capitulated under Rudd and Gillard and then, you know, I mean, that just put, make, puts them in a difficult position now to sort of, their, their own policy in government makes it impossible for them to... Yeah, exactly. So, so, of, so most of the issues that people are protesting about here have bipartisan support at the moment. The ALP's rhetoric has been a little bit softer and arguably a little bit more ambiguous. But the current regime we have of locking up refugees indefinitely has fostered under the auspices of both the major parties. And I think that's important to acknowledge that this isn't just the Liberal Party. Labor is also really complicit in this stuff. Um, I think what the more interesting question for me, though, is that in a political landscape where both the major parties are pretty firmly entrenched in their current positions and this is not yet a major election issue, what can we do as people on the ground to mobilise more community support, but actually also to translate existing community support into tangible outcomes? Because yeah, sure, right now, probably the majority of Australians are barely aware of this issue and certainly wouldn't be swinging their vote over it right now in this, in this particular political moment. But there are still tens of thousands of people in this city alone who object to what's going on here and who are really concerned. So whether or not they are a political majority is perhaps slightly irrelevant. They are a substantial constituency. And the question is, how do we mobilize those tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of people who already care to actually take forms of action which will be effective? And that's why I've gradually come towards the view that mass civil disobedience is necessary and perhaps has been one of the key missing elements of previous generations and iterations of refugee rights advocacy. I think for a long time, a lot of the thought leaders within refugee advocacy spaces have adopted a more incremental reformist approach where they've been reluctant to rock the boat too much and where they've sought to maintain a seat at the table. Now, that's not to criticise any individuals or any particular organisations, but there's been a general trend where a lot of the organisations which are most active in the refugee resettlement space and the refugee advocacy space are heavily reliant on government funding and don't want to speak out too strongly in public against the government for fear of jeopardising those funding agreements. And so in a context where the, the biggest players are essentially too timid and the major parties are firmly in lockstep around this issue, it falls to activists to be much more vocal and perhaps almost antagonistic in order to draw attention and to shift the Overton wish window and push that conversation along. And I think it's in the last few weeks we've seen activists who are willing to not only take to the street but occupy the street and remain in the street that there's been much more media attention on this issue which is in turn provoking political responses. What do you think is a is a is the is the is the preferable refugee policy and how can we win majority support for that? Mm. Um, so my view doesn't really depart strongly from the Australian Greens and you can look up the Australian Greens policies on, on their website. But in a nutshell, I think we need to have a much more open position where any refugees who arrive on shore, whether by boat or plane or whatever means, have their claims assessed promptly and are immediately granted asylum and can remain in Australia long term. That's the starting point, that refugees who show up in Australia should be granted asylum. Above and beyond that though, we need to have clear pathways regionally for people seeking asylum to actually get to Australia. Um, people often complain about, oh, but refugees come in by boat, They're, it's very risky, we don't want to be encouraging these dangerous sea journeys. Well, if you don't want to be encouraging a dangerous journey, provide a safer alternative pathway. If we, if we were really concerned about people drowning at sea, we would have giant cruise ships stationed in Indonesia and, and ready to take people across to Australia on a regular basis or planes or whatever. The point is that the solution to deaths at sea is not to have a hard border approach, it's to, to provide safer pathways. But I think it's, we can't separate refugee policy and immigration policy from broader conversations about how the Australian nation state is structured and how the economy is, is managed. Right now, we have a political system that enriches a privileged minority at the expense of the vast majority. So people are struggling to pay the mortgage, people are struggling to put food on the table. That's not because there's not enough to go around. That's because we're not a wealthy nation. It's because a small elite minority are hoarding wealth and power for themselves and then turning people against one, each one another 
telling people to blame the refugees for their own financial difficulties. So really uh, a utopian anti-capitalist program is about saying, yeah, there's more than enough to go around and we don't have to choose between helping the refugees or helping the homeless. We don't have to choose between supporting new arrivals and supporting First Nations sovereignty. We can actually have a better world for everyone if we simply make the big end of town pay their fair share and redistribute that wealth fairly throughout society. And I guess one thing in particular, I think some sections of the refugee movement or I guess refugee advocacy have been prepared to compromise in recent years on the question of boat turnbacks. Now mm. you mentioned that. I mean, mm. I think that's an important thing to be specific about. Mm. I mean, I guess you just... Yeah, I, I think it's abhorrent that we would turn back boatloads of refugees as soon as they enter Australian waters. That's not something that we should assent to. It's not something we should even contemplate as a reasonable step forward. Um, the argument in favour of boat turnbacks is that you're discouraging people from making risky sea journeys, but that is completely ignoring what happens to those people after you turn them back and isn't dealing with the fundamental issues of why they're fleeing persecution and war in the first place. So And the deaths in detention too. All of that. Yeah. The, and, and let's not forget the refugees who get turned back often end up in really bad detention centre situations in countries like Indonesia. It's not like those people who are turned back go on to live a good life somewhere in Southeast Asia. Um, they become undocumented migrants in countries that are, are very hostile to their very existence. What would you say to people who say that a local councillor shouldn't concern yourself with um, issues like this? This is a federal matter. It's not a, not a matter for local government. I would say that not only is this a matter that every local councillor should be concerned about, but this is an issue that every single resident and citizen should be concerned about because this is our government enacting systemic human rights abuses against thousands of people on an ongoing basis. So put aside levels of government, it doesn't matter who you work for or what your level of responsibility is. You have a moral obligation to stand up and speak out against these kinds of injustices. I think it's particularly valuable for local councillors to speak out because we are directly connected to the local community, but we also have the legitimacy of elected office. And I think it's important for more city councillors to use their platform to raise these issues and recognise that human rights abuses aren't just a federal government issue, they're not just a state government issue, they are a whole of society issue. And as a local councillor, I've been able to use the platform of elected office, but also the resources to shield and support this community campaign. I've been able to provide PA systems and gazebos and practical on the ground support that makes this community blockade more sustainable. And I think that's a really important role. It's not up to elected representatives to lead these social movements, but we need to actively support them. And using the resources of the nation state in whatever ways we can is a powerful and subversive act. Anything else you want to say? Just that I feel like this movement is still growing. It's really hard with any kind of community campaign to predict exactly what the outcomes will be. And often it doesn't look like you're going to win until you're suddenly winning. It's, there's often this sort of period of uncertainty where no one's quite sure what's going to happen. And it's hard to see how the community pressure on the ground is actually going to translate to a tangible outcome. But then suddenly, sometimes in the space of weeks or even days, all that built up community momentum and energy translates to a massive policy shift or a broader social change. And so our job as activists is to build the infrastructure, build the foundations, create the conditions where those big shifts can happen so that when the political moment is right, we're ready for it. And I think that's what's happening here on the ground in Kangaroo Point. It could be a month, it could be a six months, it's hard to know. But we do know that more people are taking an interest in this issue and pretty much for the first time in my lifetime, I'm seeing hundreds and hundreds of people who are willing to risk arrest and engage in disruptive civil disobedience about the issue of refugee rights. That's not something we've seen in the last decade, at least in Brisbane. People have been willing to attend Saturday morning protests and sign petitions, but we're now seeing large numbers of people who are willing to block roads in the CBD during peak hour if necessary. And that kind of willingness to engage civil disobedience is a very difficult thing for the government to resist long term.